Hi, thanks for joining me for this voiceover presentation. So in our previous part of this chapter, we have been introduced to prokaryotic cells. And now it is time for us to focus on a more complex cell type, the eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells contain many different types of protists, fungi, plants and animals. What they all share is the fact that their genetic material is stored within a specific structure called the nucleus. The nucleus is enclosed within a membrane-bound structure. And this really is a key characteristic to eukaryotic cells. The structures are housed within specialized compartments. In addition to these three components of a cell, which we have already seen earlier, we have a bit more structures to consider. But let's remind ourselves of the typical components of a cell. We have a cell membrane, which separated the inside and outside of the cell and regulates the movement of materials across it. In addition, we have cytoplasm, which is all that material held inside the cell. Often you can imagine it as a fully or semi-transparent jelly-like substance. And then, of course, we have our genetic material. This, in case of a eukaryotic cell, was stored inside a nucleus. Well, as I said, there will be a number of structures for us to go through in regards to eukaryotic cells. But actually, we can classify them into four main categories. Firstly, the storage of genetic material and processing it into something useful, and this would be proteins. Secondly, the membrane systems within the eukaryotic cells. Thirdly, energy production and use. And finally, the cytoskeleton, which provides the structure for our eukaryotic cells. Okay, so there are two types of eukaryotic cells that we will be looking at, animal cells and plant cells. And at this stage, I do want to make a bit of a disclaimer. These are generalized models of a typical cell each. And really, I would be surprised if you are ever going to find a cell that looks exactly like either one of these. This is because these models show all key structures in proportion to each other, but really in life cells are typically showing more of some characteristics and less of others. So the first structures that I want to talk about with you guys is the nucleus and ribosomes. Nucleus is where the genetic information is stored at. What you will notice from this diagram is that it, the two-layered nuclear envelope has openings, these little pores that allow material to pass in and out of the structure. What you will also notice is that we have chromatin. This is the mass of protein, RNA and of course DNA that normally looks like this mass that we are shown here. However, when we enter the cell division stage, it condenses and coils up into chromosomes. Remember those egg-shaped blobs of DNA. We will look at them more a little later on this course. Well, what do we have in DNA? We have genes. These are the specific pieces of information in this material, instructing to make a string of amino acids, which gives rise to a specific protein. What else do we have in this diagram? Uh, well, DNA is transcribed into RNA at the nucleolus. Remember, DNA never leaves the nucleus. Instead, message RNA travels to the cytoplasm of the cell and reaches a structure called ribosome. Let's have a look of that a little more. 
So here we have DNA double helix inside a nucleus, and it has been coded into a message RNA that then reaches a ribosome. On this picture, the ribosome is shown as this red blob made of two subunits. You will find ribosomes both in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So, ribosome has transfer RNA carrying matching amino acids, which are coded by three nucleotide units at the time. And they are brought to the ribosome, where these amino acids are built up one after another as a string that then makes up a protein. So really, the main job of ribosomes is to be these protein-making machines. You can find them either in cytoplasm or attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, as shown in this picture. So that was our first set of structures to be familiar with. Let's move on to talk about endomembranes. These are all the membranes within cytoplasm. So there's many of these, including the nuclear envelope, which we just saw, the endoplasmic reticulum, which we are seeing here, the Golgi apparatus, which we will talk about in a bit, and many different vesicles, which we shall look in a while. So at large, the overall function of these membranes is to form compartments within a cell. So basically they divide the cell into functional and structural parts. In addition, they play an important role in transporting materials within the cell. So let's look a little bit more of this endoplasmic reticulum that we have shown here. Often you will find out that we abbreviate it as ER because I guess no one has time to write out endoplasmic reticulum each time that we mention it. So it is a bunch of membrane-formed channels and sacs, and to a large extent, continuous structure. When we talk about ER, you can find two types of it. Rough ER has ribosomes bound to it, so I guess it looks a little bit more bumpy or rough. And this type of ER, the rough ER, is where we process proteins. The other type, smooth ER, does not have ribosomes, but still serves many important functions. How about we have a look of the Golgi apparatus next? It is this light bluish structure on the bottom of the figure here. So the Golgi apparatus is really just a stack of flattened sacs. Often when I explain students about its role, I make a comparison of a trucking business. So Golgi apparatus would be like a warehouse or a distribution center where some materials are brought in, in this diagram from the ER. Then they are sorted and repackaged and eventually sent out. This diagram also shows lysosomes. These are membranous vesicles that contain many di digestive enzymes and serve the purpose of carrying these digestive enzymes that can break apart unwanted stuff within the cell. They are related to many clinical conditions and I believe that your textbook mentions Tay-Sachs disease as an example of it. You can read more about it in your text. Finally, the last group of endomembranes that I want to mention is vacuoles. These are very large membrane sacs. And often they are very prominent in, for example, plant cells, where they can take over most of the cell. You can consider them, for example, as a garbage plant or a, of a plant cell. Any material that we cannot get rid of from the cell in a plant ends up building up there. Okay, we are ready to move on to talk about energy-related organelles in a cell. So let's look at the powerhouses of the cell. And we have two types to discuss about, chloroplasts and mitochondria. So let's start with chloroplasts. You will find them in plants and algae. Well, what really is their job? 
Well, I am so excited because this is probably my favorite formula in biology. Isn't that just pretty? Well, this formula stands for photosynthesis, of course. And we will be talking more about this formula and going in more detail later on in this course. So, if for now you are just happy with the idea that the, there is such a formula, and that's it. I am totally cool with that. But for anyone who wants to crunch down this formula, I am going to quickly go through it here, but do not let that overwhelm you. So, for the photosynthesis, we need carbon dioxide. And water. In fact, you will notice that there are number six in front of each of these two molecules. And that simply tells us that for this equation, we need six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. This has to do with making our formula balanced. Like in mathematics, your equation needs to be balanced on both sides. Again, if this feels overwhelming, do not worry about it just now. So, what do we do photosynthesis for? Well, it gives us sugars, which is a great chemical form of storing energy. In this case, we have a formula of one glucose molecule here. But all the same, it's basically sugar. And it is for these sugars that we eat food for. This is the energy that we get from our diet. And what is super convenient for us humans and other animals on the Earth is that as a byproduct of photosynthesis, we get oxygen. How cool is that? Really, it is my favorite formula in biology because it is the basis of all life. And later, when you go to study anatomy and physiology, you can just use this formula in reverse to show all that your digestive system does. But, okay, let's go get back to our mitochondria. So you can see that there is this double membrane outer structure that encloses the stroma. Within stroma, we have thylakoids, which are these disc-like structures. They can be stacked as a pile on top of each other, and each of these stacks is called granum. One more thing that I do want to mention before we move on, and this is going to be quite important if you end up studying plant genetics, is that chloroplasts contain their own DNA and ribosomes. So really, it is thanks to the chloroplasts that we get energy harvested from the solar energy and it gets stored as a chemical energy which we animals then are able to use to drive our processes. So let's have a look of the mitochondria. Whereas chloroplasts are only found in plants, since animals such as humans cannot do photosynthesis ourselves, Mitochondria are found both in plant and animal cells. You would probably really need an electron microscope to see them, so if you have had a chance to go to a lab and look at cells with a light microscope in your later studies, please do not kill yourself by trying to find a mitochondria with that method. It is not going to happen. So, why do we have mitochondria? What are they and what is their job? Well, they break carbohydrates to produce ATP. This ATP is the cellular energy currency and stands for adenosine triphosphate. We will talk about that a little later in this course. So, for the mitochondria to do its job, it needs also oxygen, and it will produce carbon dioxide. If we look at the structure of a mitochondria, we will see that it has all these folds inside it. I have actually included a real electron microscope image to go with the diagram, hoping that you will believe me that these do actually exist. So, why do we have these folds inside it? 
Well, they give a larger surface area for the processes that take place when we break carbs into ATP. And we will discuss these in more detail later in the course. Also, again, if any of you were going to go into genetic field, say for example forensic work, which I have some background in, you might want to know that mitochondria have their own DNA and ribosomes. Why is this important? Well, turns out that mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from mother. Now, this opens a lot of possibilities for genetic testing work. Okay, we have one more bulk of structures to look through. And these are the structures that provide the structure of the cell and help with movement, both the movement of materials and actual muscle constructions. So this is a little different view of some of the things that you have seen already earlier on, and I want to show another figure. Isn't this beautiful? This is why I love biology. I get to see some of the most beautiful things that exist. So what you are seeing here is the cytoskeleton of a cell. It is a filament and tubule system inside the cell, and it gives the cell its shape, allows it to move if it is a cell that moves, and also provides what you could consider as highways within the cell for moving materials within the cell itself. And there is many subparts to it. For example, here you will see motor proteins, which are important for movement. For example, if you go to study anatomy and physiology of a muscle contraction, actin and myosin will be very familiar to you. We also have microtubules, which are these small hollow cylinders, and other components of cytoskeleton, such as intermediate filaments, which we will we'll not review here. There is something more that I do really want to mention to you before we finish this video. And these are centrioles. You will find them only in animal cells, not in plants. And why I want to introduce you to them is that they are important when it comes to the cell division later on, when we discuss about that. And I will leave it to that just now, but be aware that we have those structures. Finally, the very last thing that I want to add is that there are various adaptations on cells that need to generate movement. And what we see here is cilia and phalagella. For example, wall of the bronchi, your windpipe, is lined with these finger-like projections that sweep it clean and move any dust particles and other dirt that should not be there up back to the trough where you can swallow it down. For an example of phalagella instead, I have included a picture of sperm cells. Their tail is very important for generating movement so that the sperm can find its way to the egg cell. Okay, this has been a lot of information to take in, I'm sure, so let's take a break here for now. Next, we will look at the structures outside the cell.